wonderful to see you all here. Very exciting. Um, I just want to welcome you all to uh, this evening's lecture and thank you for coming to the reception tonight. And it was just a great event. Um, this evening, of course, I have the honor of presenting our distinguished photographer, Keith Carter. But before I do, I would just like to make some acknowledgments. I do want to thank Tom Santelli for the inspiration to bring the artist to St. Rose. Thank you very 
much, uh, and I, I want to uh, extend my uh, thanks for all the many courtesies that have been extended to me uh, in my uh, short uh, tenure here. It's just a pleasure to be my friend at all. I'm from Texas, that's why I, I talk the way I do. <laughs> and if it's of any interest to you, no, I didn't vote for George Bush. <laughs> Here, even though you were uh, forced to come, all the rest of you get extra credit is still a thrill. And with that in mind, I thought we would sort of live on the edge here, but I got my buddy, the IT man Ben, up there, uh, and see if I could make a little wild card thing work here. Because if, if it works, we can break both local, state, and federal laws. <laughs> But it's for educational purposes. What I want to do is show you about a, a five minute clip from a film, a movie, um, called Smoke, which uh, some of you may or may not have seen. But it's a, a, a short clip, and the scene we're going to come into uh, stars Hi Harvey Keitel as the foul mouthed owner of a Brooklyn tobacco store. And he's been on the same corner for about 40 years. And as he's getting ready to close the uh, store for the evening, he sells girly magazines, he sells tobacco, blah, blah, blah. Up comes William Hurt, the actor William Hurt, who plays a writer and one of his customers. <coughs> they don't know each other except customer and owner of the store. William Hurt comes up and says, uh, can I still get some cigars? And Augie uh, says, sure, come on in. And that's where things take an interesting short turn, I hope. Um, it's important to know that in this short scene, William Hurt is a writer, but he's suffering writer's block because his wife had accidentally been killed in a drive-by shooting a few years before, and he's still grieving. And at that point, I, I'll stop and we'll see if we can get this thing to work. And if not, we'll have a few awkward pauses, and I'll send you some Hank Williams. <laughs> Love St. Louis. That's right. 
more than 4,000 pictures of the same place. The corner of 3rd Street and 7th Avenue at 8 o'clock in the morning. 4,000 straight days in all kinds of weather. That's why I can never take a vacation. I've got to be in my spot every morning at the same time. Every morning in the same spot at the same time. I've never seen anything like this. That's my project. What you call my life's work. I'm not sure I get it though. I mean, what was it that gave you the idea to do this project? I don't know. It just came to me. It's my corner after all. I mean, it's just one little part of the world, but things take place there too, just like everywhere else. It's a record in my little spot.
looks like somebody forgot a camera. <clears throat> yeah, that's mine. So you're not just some schmuck that pushes the coins across the counter. Well, that might be what people see, but that ain't necessarily what I am. But they're all the same. That's right. More than 4,000 pictures of the same corner. Broadway and 7th, Brooklyn. That's why I can never take a vacation. I'm like that postman. I gotta be in my little spot every morning. What was it gave you the idea? Well, I don't know. It just came to me. It's my little spot. It's a record of my little spot. You know, things happen there too. But they're all the same. Well, they're all the same, but each one is different. You have your dark mornings and your light mornings and your autumn light and your winter light. You have people in galoshes and overcoats and t-shirts and sandals and sometimes the same people and sometimes different people and sometimes the same ones disappear and different ones become the same. You know how it is. The earth revolves around the sun and every day the sun hits the light, hits the earth at a different place, different angle. Time just creeps on its heady little pace. What I want to do tonight is show you a few uh, things uh, of my own work, uh, which is in some respects a record of my little corner, my little space. <clears throat> but now, my life has changed, just as if you're a student, yours will too. And I travel widely, however, and I make photographs everywhere, however, I try to take my little spot with me. And I try to make the same kinds of pictures wherever I am. Uh, not based specifically, hopefully, on wherever I am. And just to up the ante, at least in my world, because it makes me nervous, and for a guy like me, that's not a bad thing sometimes, uh, I want to show you some brand new work that I haven't shown anybody that I've done in the last couple months, because it's a good way for me to take a look at it, too. Um, so, let me see here. I'm self-taught, although, we were a single parent household before it was quite so fashionable, and my mother was a photographer for children in our little town. So I grew up around it, but not paying too much attention. That's not me in the underwear. <laughs> I'm the sharp dresser in the Argyle socks with my sister Kate and my brother Billy and my brownie Hawkeye camera. One of the more radical propositions of modern art is that your life itself can be your greatest work of art. I don't know exactly what's so radical about that. Walt Whitman said it better 170 years ago. Love the earth and the sun and the animals. Go freely with powerful, uneducated persons and the mothers of young families. Give alms to everyone who asks, argue not about God, and your very life can be a great poem. I've been making photographs now for uh, going on 40 years, and I've tried to distill down a couple of my experiences that are born out of my experiences that I thought, think might be on occasion useful for uh, my, sometimes my colleagues, but Certainly, uh, um, some people who some are younger than me. Seven mantras. Number one, travel when you can, especially if you're young, because the lessons you will learn and the things that will stay with you for the rest of your life are manifest. They don't go away. The people you meet, long after lectures like this fade, those memories and those little things that change you when you travel won't change. 
we all need the work of other people. I don't think it's a smart thing to try and work in a vacuum or think you're God's greatest gift to the art world. I think it's good to acknowledge the people who've influenced you. I think it's good to share your work with other people. I think it's good to talk about it. I draw, uh, derive from a lot of sources. Aside from uh, my colleagues or the history of photography, I, I read a lot of different things, but that's no secret. A lot of you do the same thing. <clears throat> but if I gave you this assignment, a wonderful poem, a famous poem by William Carlos Williams, who in real life was a physician and he wrote this famous poem, The Red Wheelbarrow, at a time when physicians still made house calls. And he was in a rural area where his young patient, a young girl, was hovering between life and death. And he looked out the window. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow, glazed with rainwater, beside the white chicken. One of the great things about photography is there's many ways to make a photograph as there are people with cameras. But if I gave you this assignment, what would you do to illustrate this picture? Would you make a documentary picture? Would you stage something? Would you make an installation? You know, what would you do? That's a beautiful thing. It's all about making choices. If it wasn't for the work of James Joyce, we wouldn't have Samuel Beckett. If it wasn't for Edgar Degas, we wouldn't have the work of uh, Pierre Bonnard. If it wasn't for the work of Eugene Anger, the French primitive photographer, we wouldn't have Walker Evans, as you know him. We all need the work of other people. Walker Evans, bless his starts. I swiped everything from Ashe and just did it in an American way. Number three, make friends with uncertainty. Because in my experience, it just doesn't go away. If you start a new project, you make new artwork, start a new painting, what have you, she's always on your shoulder saying, oh, it's been done before, somebody's not going to like this, this is a waste of your time, blah, 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 blah. You might as well make friends with her. Sweet talk her a little bit. Give her a kiss. <laughs> She's not going to go away. And just go on and do the work. You can, you know, figure out whether it was successful or unsuccessful later. <clears throat> Willem de Kooning, the Dutch-American painter, at the height of his fame, probably the first superstar, or certainly one of the first superstars in the painting world, Got a bunch of girlfriends, made a whole bunch of money, painting, selling for huge sums of money in those days. Has his house on Long Island. At the height of his fame, look at him. He's riddled with uncertainty. It doesn't go away. It's not a bad thing. It's useful on occasion. Never, ever underestimate the power of ordinary people. The power that they carry with them, particularly when photographed. When photography comes to this country on a Friday afternoon, September 20th, 1839, aboard a steamship sailing into New York Harbor are the instructions for the world's first announced photographic process, the daguerreotype process. This is an unknown woman from 1839, an American daguerreotype. And isn't she lovely? We don't know who she was or is. We don't know anything about the circumstances. What we do know is that she and presumably her husband uh, and perhaps their children are all gone, uh, buried and mourned. But you have this one silver dark jewel of an image. Skylight, quiet repose, beautiful light, lovely dress. It's like a Yeats poem. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths in wrought with golden and silver light. The blue, the dim, the dark cloth, night, the light, and the half light, night, and the light, and the half light. 
When photography is invented, it's like a little bit of magic realized, said one of the co-inventors. In France, it's uh, uh, Daguerre, and in England, two weeks later, they announced uh, William Henry Fox Talbot's paper negative process. I have a half-baked theory, and if somebody's an art historian out there, uh, maybe we can discuss it later. Um, amongst the early, uh, earliest of the Upper Paleolithic paintings, particularly in Lascaux and that whole series of uh, uh, southern French caves, uh, not only do you have these beautiful animals, but you have these beautiful handprints. And these people deep in these caves didn't stick their hand in pigment and put them on the wall. They put their hand on the wall and blew pigment around it. And it's a negative print. We don't know why they went down there. We don't know why they painted those, whether it was for fertility, for magic, for what. We don't know why they left their hand prints. One art historian says, well, maybe they were our first great prayers. Maybe, maybe not. But I think as people, there's something in us that makes us want to leave marks. And when we had a little more food and weren't worried about being eaten every day, we tried to make them beautiful. That's my two cents worth on the history of art. And now we inform ourselves, you know, in popular culture with issues. On the right is a calotype uh, from William Henry Fox Talbot. We reinvent subject matter over and over. The full weight and mystery of your art rests upon your relationship to your subject matter. What is it you find interesting in the world? Not me. What do you find interesting in the world? And upon that relationship is how you're going to work and it's going to fuel the work that you do. And it's going to inform us. In my world, it's close to the natural world, and I, grew, uh, I still have a, a lot of animals, and I live near a lot of animals, and uh, I use them in my work all the time. Uh, I use birds. They're mythological. There are all kinds of reasons to use birds. Contact sheet on the left. The raven on the right. Cotton eyes. Bird's eye, sleeping swan. I use stars or variations of stars under Saturn, juggling with the moon, barren moon, holding Venus. You can't tell in this cheesy PowerPoint, but <laughs> Venus has just come up, and it's right above the man. And Castor and Pollux are up there somewhere, but I spotted them out. Games of scale. Statue of Liberty with nine moons. Why not? <laughs> Cosmos, the universe, or a wishing well. But those are my interests. You, know, you should ask yourself, what is it you want to say? Why do you want to say it? Because we live at the level of our language. Whatever we can articulate, we can imagine, develop, and explore. That's the writer Ellen Gilchrist. Above all, thought always begins with an image, Aristotle. And in my experience, perfect moments, moments that help raise you to another plateau, seem to happen when you least expect them. When you have a conversation with somebody, when you hear something, when you go to a movie and something changes you in the scene. Back in 1992, I made this picture, and I thought it was a great failure. It turned out to be probably my most, well, not probably, unquestionably, my most popular photograph. There was two little pepperwood kids I didn't know playing with 
fireflies in a creek not far from where I live. And I asked them to hold still, and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> and I was rigid. We had my camera on a tripod, and I just made these pictures. And uh, long story short, for a long time, I thought they were a huge failure because I wanted sharpness. And it didn't happen. Uh, it took me a while to realize that I had mistakenly uh, come upon something that I would use the rest of my career, and that is the fact that a, a, a blur can just be as natural to the medium on occasion as sharpness. Sharpness, of course, is culturally desirable. Photograph on the left is called Chicken Feathers. It's starting to rain, and um, they're holding sparklers in a barnyard. And the photograph on the right, I got hired by the Gap stores when they started selling shoes. And they asked me to photograph their shoes. And I asked them if I could photograph them where I live. And they said, sure. So I, did, I put them on scarecrows and set them on fire. I put them in chicken coops. <laughs> uh, I fed, well, I didn't actually feed it, but I put it on a fishing pole, a white shoe, and had an alligator. It looked like a chicken to an alligator come out of the water after it. And then I put them on my niece in front of my little workroom door. And I thought I'd rip off this photograph I'd made for art several years before. And I bundled together about 15 sparklers. She's got a tutu on and gap shoes. But these sparklers were a Hispanic manufacturer. <laughs> And they apparently have different fire codes in Mexico <laughs> than they do in Texas. Because we lit those things and they just exploded. <laughs> and I made one frame for all oh, heck broke loose. And, and uh, she's badly disfigured, but I really like her. <laughs> she was fine. She really liked her. She didn't even move her feet. <laughs> that was a mistake to make. And I love that picture. I never sent it to Gap. <laughs> I sent it to the galleries that represent them, and bless their hearts, that whole edition sold out in a year. Which doesn't always happen, let me tell you. It was just interesting. Well, accidents in your life can sometimes become main plots. You should write that down if you're a student. <laughs> that comes from Joseph Campbell, who's one of the brilliant, brilliant minds of the 20th century. Accidents in your life can often become main plots. Whoops, we cut off the bottom for some reason here. Well, anyway, Pinocchio. Oh well, you get the idea. There's more at the bottom. <laughs> I use gesture a lot. This is called levitation, and what's actually happening here is uh, uh, I'm in an underground Roman ruin with a plexiglass top above it with a sign in Italian saying, do not walk across. <laughs> and every now and then, somebody would just walk across. Killer of ducks. <laughs> no, it's called a pram. <laughs> but in, in my, my little world, I try to make uh, photographs that, that um, have a certain implied narrative to them, but they don't ex specifically tell you uh, what you're to think. So if you want, you can. Finish the photograph, shall we say. I use gesture a lot. Uh, human body movements. Sometimes I don't use a, a, a regular camera and, and use straight sharpness. Uh, in some of my later pictures, uh, I use a little view camera incorrectly and uh, swing the, the focus incorrectly because my eyesight started changing 
And it seemed to me that it was more like eyesight, because you focus on one thing. If I look at you, you're in focus. But my brain thinks everybody in the room's in focus until I switch my focus, and then everybody goes out except who I'm looking at. And that's what I was trying to do with a lot of my later work. Oops, there's more at the bottom. <laughs> Renaissance mouse. I use animals a lot because it's a different way to tell the truth. Uh, and they're anthropomorphic in some ways. I mean, um, and my idea of heaven on earth is if I could have been present when Noah was loading all the animals two by two, and I could have had a camera and a bunch of film. <laughs> So in terms of subject matter, I'm reasonably democratic. I like all kinds of, uh, or I respond to all kinds of uh, things. Because I know I live in an imperfect world, but I still think it's a beautiful place to live in. So birds, stars, landscapes, views. Animals, children, this is called grandmother's dress. All have equal weight in my world. I was listening to an honest to God record. Or everyday things, hanging artwork. Daydream. She was asleep and I put an exercise ball on her feet. <laughs> Why not? Thirty plates, high angle, tilt the horizon line, it's a slightly oblique angle, camera's not strict, strictly in front of it. Changes all the spatial relationships. And here I'm using a, a good camera with a really bad lens uh, on it that only focuses in the center. Stairway. Dawn. So sometimes they're straight documentary photographs, uh, and sometimes I tweak them a little bit, but they're all found in the real world. And here's where the positive-negative process from which all processes have descended that we use today was invented at Lake Hawk Abbey uh, in southern England at William Henry Fox Talbot's estate. He was also a botanist. And he has all these beautiful plants and trails. More at the bottom. And number seven, don't forget to play. I hate to be shallow, but I just think it's a joy to make pictures. I just think it's fun. I still think it's fun, and I should have a better intellectual reason. You know, I should have a scholarly reason. You know, I know that. But I still think it's just a joy to do, to be out in the world, to be around other people. Now, I'm going to show you about eight or ten pictures. It's brand new work. And um, the scholarly way of talking about this is it addresses issues um, of theology, anthropology, sociology, uh, adornment, and perhaps obsession. If I'm describing it to my friend or to Tom, my colleague, I just say, I made a lot of photographs of women with extraordinarily long hair. It's the same thing. And if you're a student, this is a good tip. It's good to give your projects a title because it gives you parameters with, with, uh, within which to work. And I get myself a new portfolio box every time I start a new project. And I put the name on there. I start with the title, and then I start filling it. And if you're not sure of the title, 
Put it in a Romance language. Put it in French or Italian. Because it's Spanish. It's always going to sound better than in English. I'm not kidding you. This is a useful technique. Half the time, your professor won't know what it is anyway. Okay? If you really want to befuddle them, put it in Greek. It's great. Latin will kill them. It always works, and it looks good. And if you finally end up doing a book, it's great graphic design. <laughs> this is Italian, the splendor of hair. And I got confined to my studio about six months ago. Um, and I decided I'd do a studio project, which I haven't really done. I generally work out in the real world, although I have a nice little studio. It's mostly a workroom, dark room, and digital area. And I must say, I'm enjoying doing these pictures, uh, and I'm curious to see where it's going to end up. Uh, but it's a whole different ball game working in a one boxed room with one or two people in a background. It's a little more confining in some ways. And I'm going to tell you that I have a cop of, some of these women simply have long hair. Some of them belong to religious uh, groups. And I have a colleague, a scholarly colleague in the education department of my university who came up to me last week while I was showing contact sheets, proof sheets, to a long-haired woman I photographed the week before who had her hair back up in a bun. See, and my colleague walked up and said, what are you doing? I said, well, we're looking at these contact sheets of women with long hair. And she says, oh, hell, that just creeps me out. <laughs> with my nice religious woman sitting there. And this last group of pictures I'm going to show you, the jury is way out on this. Uh, it's, I've done color all my career, but mostly for commercial things on occasion. And I think if you're in the art world, which I am, that it's good for uh, artists to take, a, uh, have to please somebody besides themselves on occasion. I think commercial work makes you really learn things that you don't necessarily learn if you're just being a narcissistic artist. Uh, uh, but that's just my uh, opinion and uh, experience, but um, one of the beautiful things about the digital world is it's made color user-friendly. We don't have to now send it to a lab and have it processed and printed. You can put it on your Epson print, uh, pen, uh, printer and use the new generation of pigment-based inks, you know, in Photoshop, and you can print it in your office or, or uh, bin or what have you. And, um, One of the things we do as artists, and not only explore the world around us or the issues around us, but we explore our own lives. And uh, I got confined in the studio a while back because I got some bad news about a pesky eye problem. Uh, and when they showed me the images uh, of my eye, I thought they were, they were round and they were in a black square and they're digital files, and I thought, these are beautiful. 
I mean, they look like planet Mars. They look like something the Hubble telescope, which I had a long interest in, those magnificent images, it looked like something from the Hubble telescope. So I started taking images from the Hubble telescope. And they told me I was going to go blind in my left eye, which wasn't the end of the world because I focused with my right eye. That hasn't happened. So with that out of the way, I just don't see well out of my left eye. But I haven't gone blind. And if I did, it's not that bad. You still focus as long as you have one good eye. But I started a new series of pictures. This is the Hubble telescope itself, and it doesn't look like what it sends back. And some of you have seen those incredible images. We think now, science commonly agrees that the universe is about 14 billion years old. We, science commonly agrees that the Earth itself is about 4.7 billion years so, and we can see with that telescope faint smudges of red, which are from areas of the universe 13 billion years old. And light from those faint smudges of red are only now reaching the Earth. And if that doesn't um, resonate with you, light, traveling at the speed of light, doesn't age. So you can walk out tonight and starlight 13 billion years old, that's only now arriving, will wash over you. And it never aged. Uh, there's something wrong up here. These should be circular, but uh, you're artists, you can uh, use your imagination. So what you're looking at, and what I'm working on, uh, is more or less my first sort of digital project. Although I love film, and I come from a film background. And in my world, when I came of age, the heart of photography was camera, film, and a dark room. Uh, in your world, um, you have many more ubiquitous picture-making systems, satellites, um, you know, your cell phones, um, ATM machines, there are all kinds of ways to make pictures now. But for a man of my temperament, there just ain't no romance in pixels. But that's just me. But I'm enjoying this process. What I've done is circular images, or what should be circular images, are um, the actual images of, of the eye, what's inside them are actual photographs sent back by the Hubble telescope of what's going on in the universe. It's a far cry from what I normally do, and it's a beautiful project in some ways to work on. But you can make the argument, or I can make the argument in the lead, that if, as science uh, uh, pretty much agrees now, that the Earth and we as their people were formed by star matter, then what's happening out in the universe, stars building, galaxies dying, <coughs> when you see these photographs, they look pretty much like what you see in the microscopic photographs of DNA. I mean, there's a certain similarity. So I'm putting them together. And I'm using the titles from the Hubble uh, telescope. Storm clouds, celestial storm clouds. Eskimo Nebula. out in about two weeks. Uh, 
uh, and it's an anthology of, of about 30 years worth of uh, photographs of children. And for those of you who have endured this, you young students, let me tell you, don't ever think you can't make a difference. Most of the great bodies of thought, or many of them, have sprung from one young person. It was one young Protestant monk that started the Protestant Reformation. It was one young woman that saved the territories of France. It was one young general that expanded the boundaries of Macedonia to the edges of the known world. It was one young Italian explorer that founded the new world. And it was a 32-year-old Thomas Jefferson who proclaimed all men are created equal. Don't ever think you can't make a difference. Apple Computer Ad, 1996. You can read it on your own. said, love the earth and the sun and the animals. Thank you.
situations or photos that you prefer film or digital in? Uh, I, I prefer film, and I probably always will. Uh, there are certain situations that the digital world uh, has allowed me to make pictures that I couldn't make any other way. So that interests me quite a bit. Uh, you know, I, really, I think it's an exciting time to be alive in the photography world. I think it's a tumultuous realignment uh, all kinds of things that that are uh, changing around our ears. And it's just I think it's wonderful. You know how it is. But there was a certain romance about film and arcane chemistry and running water and dark rooms and the use of light and precious metals that I grew up with. And there's no reason for me to jettison that. I love that. It's like being a perky Coffee pot. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Where's the best place you've ever gotten to take photographs, in your opinion? Best place? Uh, oh, I can have all kinds of cheesy answers. <laughs> Probably, I like the uh, uh, rural areas of Great Britain. Because they meet most of my needs. 
I'm in a city, if I were really making photographs in your beautiful city, I'd get a bicycle. I do that all the time. I just came back from Alaska. And everywhere I went, I rented a bicycle. Because I can see. Unless I got to outside.